we are welcoming you to our museum's first ever biodiversity seminar for 2021. And we hold this biodiversity seminar series as, uh, as a way to promote biodiversity education and conservation. Uh, today, we will have a very special guest all the way from Kansas, USA. And let me tell you about Jeff or Jeffrey Weinel. Jeff is a PhD candidate at the University of Kansas, USA. Uh, he's taking a herpetology at the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology under Dr. Rafe Brown. Um, his current researches involve the snakes of the Philippines. His other interests, aside from herpetology, are systematics, phylogenetics, and biogeography. Uh, everybody, let's all give a big warm of big warm welcome to Jeff Weinel. Hello, Jeff. Um, would you like to say a few things before I turn the screen over to you? I think that uh, was a great introduction. Thank you. I'll go ahead and get started, I guess. <laughs> all right. <laughs> And thank you for hosting uh, this as well and introducing me, yeah. All right, um, I'll go ahead and get started. All right, I assume that everyone can see my screen here. Okay, so thank you again for coming to this talk and for inviting me to talk in the first place. Um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about um, some of the discoveries that have been made regarding Philippine snakes and as and the importance of uh, collections towards making those discoveries. And as was just mentioned, um, I'm a fifth year PhD student and also a curatorial assistant at the University of Kansas at the Biodiversity Institute. And I'm researching systematics and biogeography as well as historical demography of the snakes of the Philippines. And um, that building there in front of you <laughs> that you see is uh, where I usually work when it's you know, not pandemic times. <laughs> um, and then, okay. So just a little bit of an outline here. I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about the history of snake research of the Philippines in general, as well as uh, natural history collections, especially uh, kind of focusing in on what is going on at uh, the University of Kansas. Um, and then I'll talk about the, some of the discoveries that we've made from those collection specimens and sort of um, try to highlight efforts that people can do in general with research. Uh, with natural history collections, kind of following up on um, some of the things that we're doing here. And then I'll talk about how collections data um, is often used and managed. And then I'll sort of summarize and with co conclusions as well. So as we most of us probably know in this in this uh, presentation here um, that uh, the Philippines is a biodiversity hotspot, and that what that really is me means is that there's just an exceptional amount of diversity that's packed into a really small area, um, relatively um, to for the amount of biodiversity that, that there is, um, and that there's just some remarkable species, and I guess the most iconic is probably the Philippine eagle. Um, just uh, which has had, I guess, a lot of um, press and just widely known around the world, really, as as uh, sort of a particularly iconic conservation um, important species. As far as the Philippine snakes go, there's at least 142 species, so the 142 species known, but there are about 20 more that are um, considered subspecies now. Um, and 88 of those are endemic, which is a really high number, um, proportional, I guess, to the whole total number of species there. Um, 46 genera, uh, six of those are endemic, and then 12 families, which is a, really a high number, um, but only one of those is endemic. And so kind of what this, um, looking at just such a high number of, 
of endemic species, but um, sort of a low number of en endemic uh, genera and families, what that kind of um, suggests is that there are probably many different colonization events. So a lot of the diversity probably originated outside of the Philippines, but then colonized the Philippines and then um, became isolated and became you know, speciated basically. And, um, but there doesn't seem to be um, evidence, at least what this suggests is that there was little opportunity for widespread diversification events um, within the Philippines itself. So looking a little bit further at that, those uh, six endemic genera, uh, having Bungaris caligaster is the only one shown here that's um, in the family Elapidae, so that includes a lot of the cobras and venomous snakes that are iconic around the world. And then all the other ones belong to this uh, endemic family that I'm gonna talk a little bit about or focus on quite a bit of later on in this talk. So just uh, giving some historical perspective here, this is showing the number of species that were have been described each year of snakes in the in the Philippines. Um, so uh, what you see is that the majority of the diversity that is known is was described pretty much from the during the 1920s or or prior to that. Um, there was a gap kind of in the 20s through. 50s related mostly to World uh, War II. Um, and then again, later there was, there were more species described, especially by uh, like Alan Levitin, as well as many others um, that, that were uh, working in the middle of the 19th, or middle of the 20th century. And then more recently, there were, there have been more species and subspecies described by a whole, many different authors. Um, but again, just pointing out that most of the diversity is from basically based off of uh, collections and, and uh, specimens that were from the 1800s. Um, and then relatively few have been described despite the use of genetic data or lack thereof uh, in recent times. I'm going to move on to talk about some of the natural history collections, especially focusing on some of the stuff that, that Kansas. So sort of wet collections are the main um, sort of collections that are used for herp specimens. So uh, those are preserved in ethanol. And they, I guess at its core, it provides a record of a species in a particular place and time. Um, and then from that, you can really do a lot of different types of research, um, focusing on even like evolution and phenotypes, even disease type um, look, studies or, um, as, and, but then the specimens can also be used for, for teaching. Um, collections do take a considerable amount of investment and, and time and money and space. And so, um, oftentimes museums are sort of forced to make decisions about um, how much uh, how much space it can really dedicate for this. Um, and it also becomes a challenge just to take care of that many uh, specimens, but it's worth it. <laughs> so looking at uh, some of the genomic resources, at least that, that are in Kansas, um, we have collections of both tissues and archival DNA. So the, the DNA that's after it's been extracted from those tissues, um, which the tissues can get exhausted pretty fast. So it's basically we realize that if we uh, save some of that archival DNA, that is actually um, going to last a lot longer, um, just to saved as purified DNA. But uh, storing DNA, um, has to have the right conditions to really take care of it properly. And you have to consider that things like formalin or heat, uh, oxygen and UV light, all of those things are gonna damage DNA. And so much of the, the collections that are you know, just made in general around the world um, 
were collected using formalin. So they were all the wet collections of uh, like fixed and formalin. And so all of that, those specimens are not very useful for doing studies that involve DNA. So most of the genomic resources involve modern collections. And at KU, at least, we have, have our tissues and archival DNA stored in minus 80 degree freezers, but most of it is actually in minus uh, 160 Celsius liquid nitrogen doers. And the, great, the, the reason that that's in liquid nitrogen, not, besides just being at a colder temperature, a really huge advantage of that is um, that if there was a power outage, um, you don't have to rely on like electric freezers and, and such. So those resources will be um, safe <laughs> in the event of power outages. Looking a little bit further on this, I'm like, what the advantage of using of having those genomic resources are, um, in particular for regarding DNA sequences. These are incredibly useful for systematic studies. A lot of species, they may look the same or similar, um, just based on their phenotype. And so, having DNA as a as a, basically a, a data type um, is going to allow you to look. At, tease apart different groups in greater detail. Um, early on, people realized that uh, species identification was one of uh, the most important tools for, for this, so like the barcoding uh, techniques, basically, um, especially for like the wildlife trade. So that comes into phyloforensics here, um, which basically involves being able to identify where particular species um, that is being perhaps like perhaps like smuggled in across you know no illegal wildlife trade you can track down where those those particular individuals came from using fallow forensics which is going to be similar to barcoding methods um, species delimitation uh, is basically trying to determine how many species um, you have if you think <laughs> within a particular group and what those different species are. Um, that as well as phylogeography and population genetics are really areas of research that I'm personally interested in. Um, but those also require a lot of, of genomic resources. So a lot of samples um, versus some of the other um, well, they all kind of benefit from having more uh, more samples, but phylogeography and population genetics really demand having a uh, greater sample size. And all of these different areas of research are going to impact conservation implications just by knowing that, you know, that, that a, a particular species exists in the first place is going to be important for conser conserving it. And on the right, I'm just showing a figure here from a recent paper by our former collections manager, Luke Welton, uh, where they were able to trace the location of a um, Varanus monitor lizard that was being smuggled. Um, and the wildlife officers based, um, you know, discovered it. I think he was like hiding in, <laughs> under his clothes or something, trying to get on an airplane or into the country. And um, they, uh, uh, so Luke, was able to sequence the DNA and, and show that this lizard came from Mazbate population. And that was you know, helpful for, it may prevent future um, cases of, of uh, wildlife smuggling. So I work on snakes. And one of the things about snakes is that they're particularly hard to find compared to a lot of other other um, herps, so frogs and, and lizards are often a little bit easier depending on what you're looking for. But as for snakes in particular, there's usually a few species that you can fairly reliably find. Um, one of them is a Hetula persina, the vine snake there. Although even though I say that it's, it's you know, uh, one of the more commonly found snakes on a recent trip that I was on, I, I was, uh, in Mindanao and along with uh, an undergraduate student that I'm working with and 
he's studying this this particular species, and I pretty much promised him that he was going to find the snake. Um, and the entire trip couldn't find one Hetula persina. So <laughs> sometimes even the common ones are are difficult to find. But then there are other cases where they really are hard to find, such as acute type lops banaorum. So this species is only known from two, two individuals from one locality. And that really makes a lot of different types of projects difficult to know. It's, we don't know enough about what this particular species does in the wild. Does it really only occur in that one locality or is it more widespread? Um, and so it's, it can be difficult to conserve this species um, or just to study it in, in many different ways. So continuing with that, um, the, basically the cryptic nature makes them difficult to study, um, but it also, it makes every specimen that is collected incredibly important. And it would be a shame that if those are, uh, you know, lost or it, due to basically, uh, if they're, those specimens are not properly taken care of, um, then it's it really wastes all of that time and effort that was put into finding these, these difficult to find animals. So here's just a look at kind of the collections that are at the, at the University of Kansas. And this is from, this is all the frogs, lizards and snakes that we, uh, that are currently in the museum from around the world and tracking it through time. So what you see is that, as I mentioned before, snakes are basically the heart uh, or the least of found of the those three groups of, of herps. Um, and what you also probably notice is that only a small fraction of those actually have tissues. So doing a lot of different studies that require DNA, um, such as phylogenetics and systematics, you're only capable of really um, making molecular phylogenies out of a small portion of that collection. And most of those tissues are from relatively recently, um, beginning about probably 2005. So that's when actually when Rafe Brown, um, current curator, um, got to KU and he really uh, ramped up the efforts on uh, sampling tissues, which has made it possible to do a lot of a lot of different types of research, and especially for my research as well. So focusing in just on the Philippines um, collection, the solid lines yeah, show all specimens and the dashed lines with tissues. And what you can see is that there's a much tighter fit between those specimens with tissues and without. So basically everything that was collected, almost all of it, had, um, they were, Rafe and, and colleagues were, collecting tissues with those, those specimens. But you can see that snakes kind of, they haven't quite figured out how to collect those as <laughs> what was the other groups. And so I guess one implication of this is basically is that um, there hasn't been the opportunity to work on a lot of the types of projects that I'm now working on until now because there wasn't the necessary sampling until kind of relatively recently. So I'm going to move into some of the discoveries that we've been making at, um, or that have been uh, possible from these, these collections. This is showing, sort of reiterating the fact that there are often a few common species and that most, most of the species are really uh, undersampled. So you can see that, for example, that, that top most collected uh, species is Hetula persina, that vine snake that I showed before. Whereas most of the species have one or two samples. When I got to KU, I was particularly interested in, in learning or in studying about the reed snakes, which are, include both the uh, calamaria species and pseudorabdian species. There's been a lot of uncertainty about how many species there actually are in these groups. 
And um, so, and a lot of these look very similar. Um, and so you really need DNA if you're gonna properly answer the question of how many species are there and what are they? Um, and you can see here that most of the, the species that are in the KU collection um, are, there's only one or, one or two samples for most of them. Um, but even then, I was still interested in looking at sort of getting a backbone phylogeny, I guess you could say, um, of this group. Another thing I was interested in, it was just trying to find out what, um, what tissues in the collection are the most uh, sort of would answer the biggest questions, I guess. And so I was kind of looking at what uh, of those uh, tissues, what belong to species that are have never been sequenced before. And so I use GenBank. I'm sure that most of, or many of you have probably heard of GenBank, but that's where uh, most of the, the sequence data uh, is supplied to the public, I guess, um, after studies are published. And so most of the species have never been sequenced, or at least at that time. Um, and then three of the genera that for which we had tissues of um, had also never been sequenced. And those three genera that had never been sequenced were Cyclochorus, Hologarum, and Myersophus. And so these three, uh, these three genera um, in particular are really en enigmatic and, and, and really um, uh, poorly understood in general, both in their systematics and in their natural history. And so Meyer Sophus in, in particular is, um, there are no photos of it alive. And, and also uh, it was only you know, described in like 1963, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and it, uh, the systematics of this group, it was kind of unclear what they're closely related to. So there have been some hypotheses about um, cyclochorus and hologram. They're probably closely related, but we're not real sure. Um, and as far as what family they even belong to was really, really unknown. They were, they, maybe they're natricine snakes. So that includes like garter snakes and, and um, uh, keelback snakes and such like that. So a lot of the water snakes. Um, and then Myersophus thought maybe it's closely related to this other snake called oxyrhabdium. But then again, we don't know what family those belong to. The probably the, the only hypothesis that was really presented was that maybe they belong, maybe they're closely related to this uh, snake from India called, uh, called Xylophus. But that really doesn't make any sense <laughs> because that one's in India. <laughs> so, so I guess the everyone was kind of just, you know, put their hands in the air and didn't know <laughs> what was going on here. So we sequenced DNA from these groups. And what we found kind of shockingly is that um, all of those endemic genera besides Hemibungaris are close relatives to each other. So Myrosophus and Oxyrabidium are actually, you know, like we thought closely related and then Hologarum and Cyclochorus, but they all are closely related. And it didn't matter which, you know, phylogenetic method we were using here. So, um, and, and we also found that unnamed lineage, which I'll talk a little bit further. So as I mentioned, Cyclochorus and Hologarum, they turned out to truthfully be each other's closest relatives. And as well with Oxyrabdium and Myersophus. Here, so this unnamed lineage, this individual was, mis was uh, cataloged as, I think this one was actually cataloged as Calamaria, but anyway, closely related to the Pseudorabdian group here. And so as you can see, a lot of the Calamaria and Pseudorabdian, um, it would be easy to mistake this as, as uh, that the unnamed lineage is belonging to that group. It's a tiny snake, it's iridescent, it, you know, superficially does look like that. Um, but it turned out that it was closely related to Oxyrabidium myrosophus. And I, at first I was 
I thought maybe it was you know, contaminated sample or something, but then I went and looked sort of closer at their morphology and you could, and there were clear similarities um, that were, they had some traits that were similar to actually cyclochlorous and horlogarum as well as with oxyrabnium and myrosopis. And so, and even more incredibly is that this whole group is really, really old. And so, like we estimated potentially 30 million years um, and it may be a little bit younger because there's a, a kind of a wide range of uh, on that, that uncertainty there, but it's still, it's an old clade and probably the oldest clade of all of the, the Philippine herps or all of the Philippine uh, snakes, I should say. Um, and what this really is saying here is that unlike what was, uh, what was thought prior rather than all of the Philippine snakes sort of assembling um, or colonizing independently, there it turns out that there was a group that diversified early on within the Philippines. And so we describe this as a new family. And this is sort of showing a little bit more information on this, what this, this map, um, is showing here is where the number of, uh, basically it's a heat map sort of, of the number of genera that are, are in a particular area from the cyclochorid family. And so that darker red there in Northern Luzon is, is where most of the diversity is in this group. And in Mindanao, there's kind of shockingly few, but that could also be from sort of sampling bias, but it's hard to tell. Um, but at least for now, there's only two genera known there. Um, but the Palawan and the Sulus, they don't have any. Um, and I think that this really is, uh, this is showing more evidence that this group diversified within the Philippines and hasn't had the chance to sort of go back out of the Philippines. So, here, um, sort of moving on from, from that a little bit, uh, once we had a chance to, to uh, sort of understand what relate, what family, I guess, that, or describe that new family, um, we were able to um, summarize a lot of the taxonomy um, and, and uh, distributions of all of these Philippine snakes. So Al, Al Levitin, in particular, uh, sort of spearheaded this particular project. Um, and we reviewed all of the museum records for which we could uh, find and trust from more than 30 museums, and then supplemented that data from records that were uh, really obviously correct from iNaturalist and as well as from the literature. And we were able to map the distributions for all species of snakes in the Philippines. And this is really something that is, uh, I think, going to be useful for a lot of um, collections, uh, basically all over the world, um, with regard to having specimens that are from the Philippines, I mean. And so I think one, one thing that would be important is to um, go back and look at these different collections. So um, like, for instance, at uh, UPLB, basically look at reviewing some of the, uh, localities and, and species identifications on those, on those, on those uh, specimens and comparing it to some of these maps and, and seeing are some of these species actually only restricted to these areas or do we have other uh, geographic range extensions that we need to recognize or maybe it's the species identification that's incorrect. So there's a lot of uh, information that I think can be gathered from collections that are at um, like the Philippine National Museum, for instance, that need to be compared to what is found here. And I think, so moving on to this next uh, paper here, that also can be um, aided by the fact that there's, we uh, created a key basically for all of the Philippine snakes. And so I think that this will um, help doing a lot of the, the research on sort of uh, updating the collections that are currently out there. And 
this is also kind of getting back to why uh, collections are important and to begin with, because we're only able to do projects like this when there are properly cared for uh, collections. So one of the species that we actually included in that, uh, in that key was this uh, unnamed lineage. And we, we called it unnamed lineage in, in the paper. Um, and we really didn't, uh, we, we wanted to give the, the focus on that, you know, diversification in the, in the entire family, its own sort of uh, uh, highlight that in its own paper. But we knew that we were gonna have to come back to um, this particular species at some point. And I wanted to, for one, try to find more of them in the collection and as well as maybe finding some in uh, the field. And so we're uh, unable to find any more in the field, but we did find two more in the collection at KU. And so the other two individuals were also misidentified as either Calamaria or Pseudorabdian. And you can see um, we, which we named it uh, as a new genus and a new species, uh, Levitonius myris. So Levitonius honoring a Leviton, but, um, and then uh, the common name, uh, what I uh, dwarf burrowing snake. So after the what I uh, sort of peoples of, of, of the Samar Leyte area. Um, and uh, both of the, uh, the localities here, so there's two localities, um, one from Samar and one from Leyte. So the next question is, since we weren't able to find any in the, the field and there's only a few rec recorded specimens, um, how, can we, uh, how can we find out the most about its natural history? And what we ended up doing was using CT scanning. Um, and because a lot of the skeletal anatomy can tell us some important things about the natural history of these, um, of the, the species. And so we sent these specimens down to Florida to be CT scanned. And you can also access these scans on MorphoSource. So these are the results of CT scanning. What, one of the sort of uh, amazing things that we ended up finding after <laughs> trying to quantify this, this CT data is that uh, Levitonius myris has among the fewest number of vertebrae of any snake really in the world. And it's, it's a case of miniaturization in snakes. And so that often involves sort of a reduction in the number of vertebrae as well as the sort of simplification of the skeletal anatomy in the sense that some bones are often lost, especially in the skull. And um, also you kind of have uh, some bones that tend to fuse to each other. So uh, other very unexpected finds that sort of like bonus data here is um, that it's also pertaining to the natural history though. Um, we found out that something about both the uh, way, the, the number of, basically the number of, of eggs that, that uh, these species can, can uh, lay. So um, myrosophis in particular, we didn't know anything about um, the clutch size or even if it laid eggs at all. And so after we got these scans, we were like kind of blown away that this information was right there uh, the whole time. Other things that you can tell from these CT scans are related to diet, um, especially involving the maxilla and maxillary dentition. So uh, that species on the right there, Semidonastes, that one's a that one eats a lot of lizards. It pretty much only eats lizards. Um, but it, yeah, it really likes lizards. And one of the things that happens when uh, you're a lizard specialist is that you, um, especially skinks, you have um, enlarged anterior and posterior maxillary teeth. And then if you really like to eat a lot of hard bodied vertebrates, you end up with um, uh, sort of an, an angled maxilla. Other things that we can tell based on the skeletal anatomy um, involves where the species kind of spend most of their time. Are, are, do they live underground? 
Do they climb trees? Do they swim most of the time? So we were interested in, in trying to find out this information for Levitonia since there wasn't really any recorded data <laughs> for that information um, to, to go off of other than the specimen. Um, and in particular, the inner ear is one of the, the better um, characteristics that you can use because the um, sort of ear auditory uh, uh, canals going on there um, can is really going to be have a different morphology based on uh, that imp impacts the balance of the of the organism. So on the left there you have uh, species that uh, need to have more sensitivity for balance. So aquatic and arboreal species, whereas the fossorial ones, it's not as important, you know, they're not going to fall out of a tree or anything. So um, the, the uh, ear, inner ear is, is, has a completely different morphology. So we got actually even higher resolution scans of the skull, skulls themselves and we're able to uh, tell a little bit about what the um, natural history of these species are. And as well as just um, how much variation in, in, the, in the skeletal anatomy there is. So one of the things you see right off the bat is that cyclochorus and hologram, you could probably tell, have a more similar looking skull and they're also the sister species to each other. So that's kind of a, a satisfying uh, result and same with uh, Myrosophus and Oxyrhabdium. They kind of, they look pretty similar. Levitonius looks pretty similar to Myrosophus and Oxyrhabdium sort of overall, but you'll notice that the skull is far more ossified. Uh, so um, there's not as much, um, uh, the, the, especially toward the posterior of the skull, there you can't see as, as many sort of fine, um, specialized, I guess, bones there. That is more uh, simplified. Looking at hologram and, and cyclochorus cycle here, uh, one of the bones that we're interested in here that's variable in this group is um, the postocular bone. And it looks, in these two species, it looks fairly uh, typical of a lot of snakes. So kind of more of a generalist um, type uh, shape. Whereas in Levitonius and the other two, uh, you have varying degrees of simplification and it's a, and reduction in, to, in size in general. Levitonius really has, it, the bone could almost be, you know, it's almost lost entirely. And that's a feature that is, is probably related to its miniaturization. The premaxilla is also highly variable uh, in this group, but it's, there's not too much that I, I can really say about this other than that it's variable and I don't really know what the implications of that are yet. The uh, supratemporal bone is another one that is really variable. And again, Levitonius's bone is almost entirely lost. Um, and this bone is, is really important uh, adaptively um, because it, it's one of the bones that limits the, the size of the, the mouth gape. So, and that's really gonna impact what the, these snakes can eat. So the larger the gape size, the larger the prey. So it, you, it makes a lot of sense that cyclochorus and hologarum, which are eating, uh, well, we, ex I'll get into that, but we expect that hologarum and cyclochorus are gonna have a larger uh, prey, basically, because they have larger supertemporals. But Levitonius probably isn't gonna eat large prey. So now going on to the maxillary detention here. Um, Levitonius myris, Oxyrhabium myrosophus, they all uh, have similar shaped teeth kind of in general. Oxyrhabium is a well-known earthworm eater, whereas myrosophus and Levitonius, the, the gut contents weren't really, uh, there's nothing known from them. Um, they, earthworms in particular really um, are digested quickly. And so oftentimes you're not gonna find anything if you look, actually look in their stomachs. Whereas hologarum and cyclochorus, um, 
there wasn't too much really published on these, um, but you, what you've, and nothing on hologram's diet, but um, what you can see based on these, uh, these CT scans is that both of them have enlarged anterior and posterior maxillary teeth. And so that really suggests that these two species are probably eating more hard-bodied prey. And in particular, Cyclochorus seems to really eat um, uh, some like hard-bodied prey like skinks probably um, based on the angle of that, that you know, the angular shape of that maxilla. Also, one kind of interesting and satisfying find that we had here was to confirm um, something that was noted uh, maybe 20 years, at least 20 years earlier, was that um, hologarum has grooved fangs. And so these snakes are not known to be venomous, at least not to humans. Um, and so, but since these grooves here are, are usually associated with um, basically uh, facilitating venom introduction into prey. So it's likely to, that hologarum does have some venom, but you know, it, it could just be for whatever they're eating and probably isn't, doesn't have anything to do with um, being harmful to humans. It's probably just helping them eat. Um, and in particular, these uh, hologarum has a, a dentition that is kind of remarkably similar to some of the species that you see in the Americas, uh, called like Tantilla in particular, they're centipede eaters. And so I guess my main, my hypothesis would be <laughs> that a hologarum probably eats some small centipedes, but that's yes, yet to be confirmed. Another important feature on their anatomy um, is gonna be the vertebral spines. Usually the more fossorial you are, so fossorial meaning living underground, um, is going to cause uh, your, the vertebral spines to be shortened. And so from this, we can kind of expect that cyclochorus and oxyrabium have a little bit more terrestrial, but not fossorial. Um, natural history, whereas Myosopus, hologram, and Levitonius have shorter vertebral spines, so they, it seems like they've probably spend more time underground. And this really makes sense when you think about the fact that the, those hologram, Myosopus, and Levitonius are the rarest ones in collections. And so it's probably because they're just underground. Looking at the inner ears, these um, really aren't as variable as kind of expected across this group. So unlike in the previous slide, we're looking at um, the vertebral spines, which really show variation that is probably related to how fossorial they are. In this case, the inner ears look pretty similar across these different species. There's some variation, but it's not that striking. And one of the things that this could mean is that maybe the uh, inner ears just evolve more slowly than than um, those vertebral spines. So they may have been, um, in particular, it means that maybe the ancestor of this entire group might've been fossorial. And then more recently, um, Cyclochorus and, and, um, and even my, my, I mean, and Hologarum and Oxyrabdium might've become a little bit more terrestrial, but there just hasn't been enough time maybe to, um, to have their inner ears change in their morphology, but that's kind of just a, a hypothesis. But yeah, <laughs> so kind of summarizing what we can infer about their natural history based on um, the CT scans here, Cyclochorus, we probably think it's more terrestrial and eats small reptiles. And that is kind of um, probably obvious to people that are herpetologists in the Philippines because they find them frequently on the ground. And I think it, this, that's, there have been uh, notes of them eating small reptiles. So that, that one's the, probably the most obvious of this group. Hologram, not much is, is known from direct evidence, but probably eats hard-bodied invertebrates based on its dentition. And I would predict that it would eat something like centipedes. Oxyravidium, probably semi-fossorial and we know that it eats earthworms. Myrosophus, it's probably more fossorial than oxyrabium and expect that it also eats earthworm based on its dentition. Levitonius, 
fossorial is probably small earthworms. That's the hypothesis, but it's going to take um, some effort of actually documenting their how they behave in the wild to really know if these are uh, true or not. So now I'm moving on to some of the, the collections data and sort of this is more focusing on how collections data are managed, I would say. So oftentimes, I guess the first thing we do is when if we're in the field is take field notes. So on the right, kind of have an example there of some field notes. Um, and it can be kind of a mess and you don't want that to be your sole source, you know, for forever. You want to try it, that that data will not be, uh, well, it's more likely that the data won't survive if you just leave it in that in that one form for, you know, over a long period of time. Uh, also, historically, there are a lot of catalog and ledger type books for museums, but um, now, uh, uh, basically, it, you want to have those in spreadsheets in some form just um, to make them useful over the long term. And so there's kind of efforts to digitize a lot of the museum uh, collections, and that's really important. Media files, so photos. Uh, CT scans, things like that. That's another form of data. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about these uh, like relational databases. So this is kind of moving on beyond Excel. And so uh, Excel has a, has some, um, Excel is awesome, but it also, there's some problems that can happen if you just rely only on Excel. Um, uh, once, you know, over time, those things kind of grow. Um, okay, so this is kind of summarizing uh, sort of uh, how a lot, when, once uh, people start digitizing data from different types, what where that data kind of ends up. So you, you often have uh, field notes um, that are, you might digitize them, put them in an Excel spreadsheet. You have various other types of data that you collect. Maybe you took some CT scans, you have some DNA sequences, then you have to digitize I guess where where those are actually located. So if you look at the arrow colors here, we have like the raw data. So like the actual DNA sequences, for instance, would be uh, that transfer of data is kind of indicated by the black line versus a link. So maybe you have a URL that's going into a spreadsheet that tells you where to look later for those DNA, DNA sequences. So this kind of summarizes what kind of information is, is really um, on hand at any point in time if you want to share that data to people. And over time, having a whole, a, you know, whole bunch of different spreadsheets with different types of data, that really gets messy and you start to, to lose track of what the most recent version is or, or um, and, and it just limits the total number of people that can really use that data. But it's still important as a first step. More useful is using what are basically called relational databases, which can take in a whole set of different tables and allow you to access all that information from a single source. This really takes away the problem of version control is, like, is gonna be a much less uh, impacted uh, problem. And you can go to a single source to, to find the data directly there or to find the link to where to get the data. So things like specify, which is, you know, what the SP stands for there, um, is a common uh, relational database. And that really allows you to access all these other types of data. I'm not sure how I'm doing on time here. Hopefully not too bad. Um, it even becomes more useful once you, that data can be uh, aggregated with a whole bunch of other uh, specified databases from various museums around the world. Then that data, those data can really become accessible to as many users as possible. And I, I think that's really the goal that I, you know, I, would, I would push for is to try to get those collections digitized and make them available to everyone in the world as easily as possible. This is just a kind of screenshot of one of the, the cool features in Specify is you can, there's a taxon tree that allows you to quickly uh, identify how many specimens you have in each taxonomic group and you can sort of click on that and um, on those different uh, nodes there and it'll quickly show you all the records of that and, and 
then link you to other data um, related to those specimens. And this is this also as an example of a, a query uh, here in Specify, just showing that, for instance, you can look up uh, the country that it's from, you can, or you can, you know, I can just type in Philippines and it'll instantly tell me what all of the collections are from the Philippines, uh, all of the things in this database from the Philippines, not all of the different, you know, collections out there. But um, and then this is all available because uh, it's linked to uh, GBIF, which I'll talk to you in a second about. Um, this is just an example of, of sort of editing a record. So this might, is kind of the information that is quickly shown to you whenever you were to, to access a particular um, cataloged specimen. This will tell you the catalog number as well as the locality, um, what the field number is, whether or not there's tissues, whether or not there's a, a specimen, a wet uh, specimen associated with that. You get a little bit of the habitat natural history remarks uh, from the, the field notes. So all of that is quickly uh, provided to you um, in that by using a relational database. Um, and then as well, all once a week, all of the, um, the specify data from at least at KU, it's synced or pushed to, to GBIF um, once a week. And so you can, any of you can look up all of this information um, from any specimen at KU um, by using GBIF. So to kind of summarize what we talked about here, there's been many decades of research um, in the Philippines on the herps of the Philippines, um, but most of that has been sort of 1920s and earlier, and there's not been as many uh, efforts to sort of address the snakes of the Philippines since the times that, that tissues have been collected. Again, yeah, natural history collections. It's really important that this is uh, th that all of these collections get digitized, um, and it, it's also important that sort of in the process of digitizing those, um, we can verify what those taxonomic uh, determinations were. Um, it's possible that there's a bunch of uh, acute tie flops that are in a museum and no one knows about it because no one looked at it or tried to re-ID it since the determination was made um, at, from the start. Once those, uh, those determinations are, are sort of reevaluated, it, then it's important to look at, at what is known about those species distributions. Probably there are a whole, a whole bunch of species um, that have uh, geographic ranges that can be, uh, that are larger than what we currently know that they are. So maybe they occur on other islands. And so that information could already be in, in collections. Um, it, it's also important to know about the phenotypic variation. So if there's only, you know, one individual or two individuals of the species, maybe there's one that's three times as large <laughs> and we don't know that. And that could really have an impact on what we think that the species does uh, in the wild you know, so, uh, regarding their ecology. And that's obviously gonna impact how that species is being conserved. And it's also important that, um, you know, these collections be properly maintained and that, uh, we can, this will help us understand a little bit more about um, evolutionary relationships in this group. So maybe there's a whole nother ra radiation of that's like cyclochordy, or maybe there's more species in cyclochordy um, that just haven't been discovered yet. So kind of going to that point again, uh, natural history collections were critical to the discovery of this uh, endemic and old clade called cyclochordy and into um, discovering Levitonius myris. And it's, uh, there could be more, there are probably other cases of, of uh, really unique and, and, you know, unknown species that are sitting on shelves out there. And it's basically, I'm encouraging everyone to go look <laughs> in their collection for stuff because it could be there. So I'll just wrap up and uh, thank everyone that I've, you know, I have a lot of people to thank here, <laughs> but um, basically, uh, obviously KU and, and Florida have been important for the, the immediate research, but in particular, Tess and Jason and, and Bo Ying and everyone in the Philippines <laughs> that I've worked with has been super influ 
uh, super important to being able to work on this. And so with that, I'll just take any questions that anyone has. All right. Thank you, Jeff, for that uh, very comprehensive uh, presentation. <laughs> okay, yeah. sorry All about right. that. Oh, uh, yeah, over okay. time. No, no. Okay, uh, <laughs> we have a few questions, so we'll be trying to uh, speed it up. Okay, um, I think uh, this, this first question was sent by an anonymous person. Uh, I think generally you've, you've, you've been able to answer it, but uh, let me give it again. So uh, mm -hmm. what is the importance of, his, of the history of science studies for actual biodiversity investigations, conservation and collections management? So what is your opinion on that? It's, I think it's always important just to understand the, the history as far as the context of what um, of what collections are out there, just to give an idea in particular, but the fact that there are, most of those species were described so early on, I think it really just shows that there hasn't been enough attention recently, usually, especially in the age of like using DNA for systematics, you see that there's a big uptick in recent times in species discovery. Whereas in the Philippines, there's a, a completely different pattern going on. There just hasn't been that, um, that uptick in, since you know, using DNA and tissues. But I think it's because there just hasn't been enough work on it. I see. So, yeah. All right, uh, there, this is a question from Willem Tan. So um, he is wondering that uh, in the study area that you were able to collect uh, Levitonius minus, uh, was there any calamaria or any other uh, similarly looking snake that right. was found? Um, so, he says that since calamaria is also inhabits a, a very similar habitat uh, mm -hmm. based on the paper. So if so, how do these snakes uh, compete or do they compete or do, do they not compete? Uh, like, uh, did the uh, Elminus take the niche of Calamaria or any other similar snake in the area? Mm -hmm. uh, what are your observations? Yeah, that's a great question. And I've often kind of wondered that myself, but as far as like how, how are they able to live in the same area? Because it, that we, there have been cal Calamaria collected from that same, those same localities. Um, no pseudorabian though. So that's kind of an interesting thing. It may, which really may indicate that, well, either <laughs> there hasn't been enough collecting to really know if there are pseudorabian there in the first place, but if there aren't pseudorabian there, maybe this does fill that pseudorabian niche. So actually, this is my question. Um, these CD scans, uh, would they mm -hmm. be available for other people's use in the future? Yep. And what are your plans to integrate them to uh, existing specimen and image databases? They are already available entirely online on Morphosource. So if you'd like, I can track down those. If, if, if anyone's interested, you can yes. uh, contact me and, and I can provide those links. But yeah, those they're all freely available already online. I'm not sure what uh, I will personally be using them for if anything <laughs> like immediately in the research <laughs> yeah, in my research so it's like you know i think the more that everyone else can can use that the better yeah probably they could uh, you know uh look at these uh ct scans to make some inferences uh, especially uh, studies that are done locally here in the philippines and if they would like to collaborate mm -hmm. with you okay so this is a question from um miss plaza um Mm -hmm. uh, she, she says, uh, she thanks you for your great and enlightening talk about Philippine snakes. <laughs> and um, you mentioned that the Cyclocoridae clade is very old and mm -hmm. she is curious to know and she just wants to be clarified if this inference happened after identifying this new species. And the so, follow-up, does this, does this mean that this clade diver diversification occurred prior to Pleistocene? If it is or not, what's the implication of this to our overall knowledge of species mm -hmm. diversification of snakes in the Philippines? Another great question. <laughs> so um, for I think the first part of that, uh, yes, it, it was, well, it was discovered after 
the phylogeny was inferred. I, so I did not even actually look at the specimen until I'd already had the DNA sequences and made a phylogeny out of it because I just I just assumed that the collectors uh, were correct in their identifications, um, and then realized that it was it was definitely something different after, especially after I looked at it secondarily. Um, and then I think this, the next part, as far as it was, so the cyclochority did diversify, diversify, at least what our, you know, based on our analyses, um, diversified much earlier than the Pleistocene. And so that, that's really something that's, uh, you, you know, I don't wanna, wanna say unique, but uh, it's definitely uh, unusual for snakes uh, in the Philippines. There hadn't been noticed much before. It may be more common than we think um, currently, but I guess the sort of um, current paradigm is that Pleistocene has been especially important time based, particularly for um, uh, speciation events because of the uh, uh, isolation and then reconnection of different uh, islands in the Philippines due to sea level changes. Um, whereas in this case, it is much earlier. So potentially, you know, 20, 30 million years ago is, is much earlier than the Pleistocene. So Miocene kind of times. Um, so that the mechanism in particular for that diversification, uh, it's hard to say <laughs> what, what in particular it would be. Okay, um, this is more specific. Uh, this question comes from our director. So he says, uh, being in the cyclochorid clade, would there be a way uh, to infer that uh, the snake has also the same smell defense if only known from uh, a small number of specimens? Um, did I get it right, Sir JC? Or like for musking, I guess, <laughs> smell defense. <laughs> so, um, I think that might be what it's our, mm. uh, I think we have to find them alive to really know. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. Um, so there's no way to tell uh, whether these new species are also, also have this uh, smell defense right now as of the moment. You know, someone will probably tell me I'm wrong here, but as I wouldn't be able to tell <laughs> based on uh, my knowledge. I mean, there might be some an anatomy I mean, uh, anatomical structures that might, um, like, you know, uh, musking glands or something that might be there mm -hmm. that you could tell, but I think you got to find them alive to really know. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, this question comes from Rafe. Yeah. So he says, uh, uh, what other groups of Philippine snakes have the potential, uh, based on your opinion, to have older origins in the Philippines? Any mm -hmm. other groups strike you as particularly good candidates for being, you know, ancient Philippine endemic clades? Yes, I think uh, Maleo type flops is one because there are so many species in that group. They're blind snakes. So they're, um, and um, they in particular, um, just because blind snakes in general are hard to tell apart again. And they, that there being that many species in the Philippines versus not in the Philippines, if they really are a clade, I think it would take have taken a long time to accumulate that many species. And so I think that they're probably an older group as well. Um, and then I think another one is Pseudorabdian because again, there's a, there are quite a few species in that group. And the majority of Pseudorabdian diversity is in the Philippines. And so. You know, even though I set out to understand Pseudorabdian <laughs> relationships, I have made very little progress as far as that goes. And so I think maybe Camilla will find that one out. <laughs> yeah. So this is a follow-up question from, um, wait, let me read. Uh, Willem, Tan, so how come that these snakes like Levitonius and Mirasophis decided to choose a fossorial and invertebrate diet? Since especially you know the latter is not common in snakes, except um, in blind snakes. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah, worms are really an uncommon uh, thing. It, looking at all snake diversity around the world, worms are pretty difficult for snakes to um, 
to consume. And but then you have these cases where um, you have an entire like you know maybe fifty species of snakes or something in certain certain families where um, they all are worm or slug eaters. And so I think that well, for one, I think that they switched to eating earthworms and maybe invertebrates um, because the niche was available and there's so many of these to eat, you know, and so it's just the, the food is there and that mm. was, and, and so they may had the right, um, uh, basically selection favored that for them to switch to that uh, because the resource was available. But I think that, um, be, and that resource was probably available because it's so hard to eat earthworms and so they just kind of got lucky <laughs> and they were the ones to do it. So this is a question from Aaron Ortega of the, uh, from Polytechnic University of the Philippines. So uh, his question is, most of these snakes can be mistaken as the other. Uh, mm. If we're only going to refer to their phenotypic features, was mm -hmm. there any particular reason or are there particular reasons why despite their genetic diversity, they were able to choose physical features that are not very distinct from one another. Right. I think that there's a lot of uh, selection for very uh, specific traits when moving underground. So the ones that are similar to Levitonius are the Calamari and Pseudorabian. They are actually cases where they both do eat worms as well. They also live in uh, underground. And so all of these, this sort of fairly similar natural history um, aspects. I think uh, selection favored similar phenotype to live in that niche, essentially. Um, and there may not be much room to uh, change from that phenotype if you wanna be in that niche. Um, and so, especially, okay, living under underground often, um, you see in snakes, they become a lot shorter. They have shorter tails they tend to lose um, the number of vertebrae as well. And um, what that is often related to also is the, a reduction in the number of scales um, and also in the smoothness of their scales. So you see a lot of the ones that live underground, they're very iridescent. And it's not that you know being iridescent is really matters to <laughs> their natural history, you know, for, for selection, but it's really a byproduct of having really smooth scales. Mm -hmm. And that uh, reduce, reduces the friction when they're moving underground. And so you, you often see these, these, these tiny iridescent uh, snakes with not a lot of scales that, that all kind of do similar things. All right. So um, probably we'll just be accepting uh, two or three more questions. So this one is from Keisha Dinolo. Uh, probably this is just more of a confirmation question. So is it possible that these snakes' uh, skeletal features have become smaller because of their preferred diet uh, from the small rodents or mammals and they became more directed to slugs and feeds and uh, earthworms? Yeah, it's kind of hard to say like what, uh came first here, you know, did they, it's probably a combination of the two, but yeah, I think that um, being an earthworm specialist, you don't have to have as, as large of a, of a, you know, of bones in general. So, because they're very narrow prey. And so you, you know, don't have to have a huge uh, mouth basically. <laughs> um, but yeah. And so it's hard to know it, was it because of the diet that sort of, constrained them to go down this, this sort of path of becoming miniaturized and underground, or was it that they were small and living in that environment first, and then the food was there, and so they made use of that? It's, it's, that's a little bit harder to, to know, but definitely it helps to have a small mouth if you're <laughs> eating earthworms. <laughs> so this question came from Raynar. Uy Barreta. So he says that uh, this is a very good talk, uh, but he's wondering what is the biodiversity status of these snakes at the present? So um, basically, yes. and what other ways do you think uh, can we do to improve, uh, to improve their conservation? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, biodiversity status, you mean conservation status? Yeah, I'm conservation sorry. status. Okay. 
for you know i i haven't looked that up in a while but as far as levitonius goes it's not going to have any any data uh, it's going to be data deficient for sure um and probably also for meyer sophus and i would assume hologaram i think um the probably most of the Cyclochorus and Oxyrabdium species, they're probably least concerned because they have pretty large distributions and they're not that uncommon to find. For, um, for Levitonius, you know, it's, I think that there needs to be more efforts really to just go in the areas where, uh, where they were first collected. There, there hasn't been that much collection um, uh, opportunity. Uh, they're all short expeditions basically uh, that it, that were for those those trips where they found them. So I think that, you know, do they occur on Mindanao? That's kind of an interesting question. If they are all over the place on Mindanao and Leyte and Samar, then maybe they're doing fine. <laughs> but yeah. um, but if they really are only in those 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 two localities, then I think that's something a little bit more to worry about because there's the, a lot of- The key would be to collect more specimens yeah, just get in the field and find out how how uncommon they are. Yeah. So that's one of the challenges for everyone here. <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, this last question. Oh, okay. Uh, we have two more questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, one is from Mechi Corpus Abenoha of from the Department of Education, Agusan del Sur. So she is wondering um, what exact documents did you you know prepare prior to prior to uh, conducting your collection, uh, mm -hmm. like letters mm -hmm. or permissions and all. Yeah. Uh, and where do you address all of these requirements? Right. So that would, Rafe can answer this a little bit more if, he, if he's around, but uh, he's, so those trips, uh, those particular expeditions were, um, were conducted before I actually even got to the University of Kansas. So I, I personally didn't do any of the collecting, um, but, those were trips were made in 2006, 2007, and 2014, um, and Rafe would have had um, all of the basically local, uh, all of the different levels of, of, of uh, contacts and documentation at that time. But um, he maybe he, I don't know, <laughs> he might be able to answer that. Sorry, I can't answer that a little bit more detail. Um, all right, but. so. Um... I think this is not the question, but Rafe says that if we want to know more about the Vitonius uh, uh, natural history, um, next time we go into the field, you should bring a shovel yes. and uh, probably uh, kindly look at the papers, acknowledgements for the permitting documents. Of course, um, um, by, by default, you have to have a gratuitous permit uh, issued by the uh, Department of Environment and Natural Resources uh, Regional Office. I I guess for the for the, in the case of Rafe, I think he has uh, what they call a national gratuitous permit from uh, issued by the Biodiversity Management Bureau. But uh, of course, you still have to you know coordinate with your with the local um, mm -hmm. community environment and natural resources office. Of course, the if you have partner agencies like uh, state universities and colleges, so well and good. Of course. Um, you have to, you know, get uh, contacts from your probably the natural uh, national museum or um, museums that are operating near your your base of uh, you know in your in your in your college or in your area. Uh, of course, you also have I think uh, Sir JC mentions that uh, for in the Philippines, very especially um, I think uh, when you are handling. Um, wildlife you have you have to have the permission of the i think it's um, more of a i forgot but it's more of the animal care and welfare yes, um, documents that you have to secure from maybe there's a committee that resides in your um, university i don't know if there's oh one. from university of kansas yes yeah um, so we definitely have uh, i cook uh, yeah all right. every Just to make year sure we have that you're following make everything sure that you know we um, are doing this all ethically as far as the animal's welfare. Um, and so we have that approved. Um, yes, all right. So that's a very, very interesting talk. Very, very interesting topic.
Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to uh, end this program. Uh, we've been over um, the time limit for already 30 minutes. Uh, we've heard a lot and we've, we, have very, we have had uh, very interesting questions and, and answers. 